Hello everyone, and welcome back to a new episode of Red Raptor Writes. Once again, thank you everyone for getting me past 1,000 subscribers. It's such an honor to have that many people looking forward to my content. You guys are the best, and I'm lucky to have one of the nicest comments sections. I just received a community tab, so I threw up an announcement for a Q&A. Be sure to find it and leave any questions you want answered. Personal, impersonal, about dinosaurs, movies, games, anything. Plus, I'll throw something together about my favorite movies. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so without further delay, today we're covering the next BBC special, Sea Monsters. This documentary brings back Nigel Marvin and has him travel through time and space to find the deadliest marine predators ever to swim our oceans. Not gonna lie, this isn't my favorite show. It can feel a little too narrow in scope, only focusing on predators and how cool it is to watch animals tear each other to shreds. So there is that hint of awesome broness, but overall it still has a lot to say. Either way, we're here for the accuracy, not how it holds up as entertainment. How scientific is this three-part series? Let's dig this up. Like always, we're going to begin this analysis with the positives. This is mostly because I don't want to start off with the impression that I'm a jerk when I start throwing hands, although some shows deserve it. Look on a mask of my boy. For starters, most of the creatures look pretty on point. This goes especially for the time when it was made. The Pictions have evolved over the past two decades, and we'll get to those later, but you can tell that the creators did the best they could for the time. There's nothing here that will leave you scratching your head, wondering what the heck you're looking at. Really, the only drawbacks are the recycled designs from the previous documentaries. Basilosaurus and Dorodon not included. You're still cool. That's right, keep moving! You know what? You know what? Yeah. Except you, you stay! The Otobanocetops was a surprise for sure, but a welcome one. This was a small, toothed whale with large tusks that made it look like a whale walrus crossover. Something you definitely see in the Avatar universe. Otobanocetops looks pretty small compared to its modern day relatives. Being only about 7 feet in length, we don't have much for scale in its scenes, but it seems about right. The show even shows one tusk to be much larger than the other, which is actually accurate. Whether this is always the case or the smaller was just regrowing remains to be determined since only one male skull is known. The fearsome Dunkleustius, thankfully, was done justice here. It won't be appearing at all in the future, I think, so I'll try to devote time here. Despite looking like a nightmare come to life, its max size is correctly stated at about 30 feet in length. For reference, Great Whites typically max out around 20 feet. That's a 20 footer. 25. Another nice detail is how Nigel says that those ugly looking teeth aren't actually teeth. Teeth actually formed in fish from modified scales. Instead, Dunkleosteus were armed with bony plates in their mouths that sharpen against each other. And boy were these jaws powerful at over 1200 pounds per square inch. Not quite as high as some theropods or megalodon, but still impressive. Not sure if it would have broken chainmail though, maybe Nigel just had some really cheap armor from the dollar store. Although, it is cool that even the youngling was shown eating the armored fish, because even in early stages, Dunkleosteus would have had a strong bite. Unfortunately, postcranial material of this giant fish is very rare, and the morphology or physical structure of the placoderm fish vary greatly. So basically, it's reconstructed to look like other fish with a similar niche. One detail that shot out to me as I watched Sea Monsters for the first time was in the Ordovician segment where Nigel and his crew had to breathe oxygen from tanks because there was much less of it in the atmosphere at the time with greenhouse gases being more abundant. Today oxygen makes up about 21% of the air on Earth, but back in the Ordovician, it was much lower, ranging within the teens. The late Ordovician is when the first terrestrial plants found so far have fossilized. A new abundance of plant life increased the air's oxygen content, decreased the CO2, and brought a period of immense global cooling which led to the Ordovician Silurian extinction event. But for the record, scientists have recently studied the DNA of plants to see how long their family tree was branching out, and what they found is that the earliest plants would have appeared nearly 100 million years before previously thought, around 500 million years ago. The design and behavior of the sea scorpion is also pretty cool. Some Eurypterids, the order that includes sea scorpions, 
had respiratory organs called chemin plotin that would have allowed them to temporarily breathe air. So yeah, it's an interesting bit of speculation that they would lay their egg clutches on the beach. Too bad Nigel never gives us a generic name though, so we can only make educated guesses as to what animal he's actually holding. Maybe small pentacopterus? Maybe the creators just made up what they thought to be the average looking sea scorpion? I really couldn't say. No matter what it is, at least the host only refers to scorpions as their namesake and not an actual relative. Despite the name, these aren't true scorpions. Both are arthropods, but scorpions are arachnids, while sea scorpions are, again, eurypterids. Imposters. Because director Jasper James and crew did a good job with this program, I can probably keep going on and on, but the final compliment I'll give is to the early ichthyosaur, Kimbo Spondylus. Being a basal member of the order, the Kimbo lacks some recognizable features found on other relatives like a dorsal fin and a more shark-like caudal fin. The ichthyosaur is also given an accurately large size, since it could grow up to 10 meters long or over 30 feet. I'm glad the BBC didn't just reuse their ophthalmosaurus. Nah, they made this creature special. Thankfully, paleontology has progressed within the past 18 years, so there are some aspects of sea monsters that don't hold up. An easy place to start would be with the Megalodon, or known scientifically as a totus Megalodon. No, I'm not giving the scientific name to sound like some uptight know-it-all. I don't know at all, I just try my best to research before each video. You see, traditionally this shark was thought to have been a very close relative of the Great White, then called Carcharodon Megalodon, and if the name sounds familiar, that's because Carcharodontosaurus literally means shark-toothed lizard. Because the shapes of their teeth were very similar, aside from the massive size difference, it was widely accepted that these two sharks were close relatives. Shark skeletons don't fossilize well since they're made of cartilage, so the teeth and jaws are pretty much all scientists have to go off of. That's why in documentaries like this, the Meg is often portrayed as a giant great white shark. This is no longer the case. The giant shark has recently been reclassified as belonging to the genus Atodus and family Atodontidae. To put it more plainly, the Megalodon descended from the lineage of appropriately named Megatooth Sharks that haunted the seas since the Cretaceous. The Great White came from the same lineage as Mako Sharks. So no, they're not close. Any similarities evolved convergently. Another shark that makes an appearance is the Stethacanthus, which appeared in the Devonian. Nigel Marvin and the narrator called this weird fish a primitive shark, when in actuality, they weren't real sharks at all. Cartilaginous fish, yes. Sharks, no. It's not a shark. In other exciting news, the pigment eumelanin was found in fossils of Tylosaurus and an ichthyosaur. The pigmentation found is what you'd find in an animal with darker coloration, so it has been suggested that mosasaurs like Tylosaurus would have been countershaded, black on top, white on bottom. This patterning would have helped them camouflage at the surface from both above and below. Ichthyosaurs like Kimbospondylus then probably had dark coloration all around to help them camouflage in the deep ocean. But take this all with a grain of salt, since this idea has been refuted on the basis that reptiles in general tend to have a layer of similar pigmentation, so it might not necessarily mean that they're dark. Also, whether or not basal ichthyosaurs evolved dark coloration already is unclear. One of the strangest and most controversial figures of the Triassic is Tanistrophius. Over the past century, it's been called fully aquatic, semi-aquatic, fish-eating, algae-eating, and even a pterosaur. I'm whatever Gotham needs me to be. In sea monsters, we see one swimming along in the open ocean, probably being fully aquatic. It isn't made clear, maybe for the best. Although the debate still seems to be ongoing, previous ideas that its neck was too heavy to balance on land have been debunked. Its anatomy mostly resembles that of a terrestrial creature with limbs and a tail that weren't specialized for swimming. But tannies were piscivorous and retained their fifth fingers, a trait seen in aquatic creatures. Plus, it has been found alongside both terrestrial and aquatic animals. 
the most likely lifestyle seems to be that of a coastal predator that ambushed from the shores of seas and rivers, a niche similar to a heron or Spinosaurus. It's difficult to tell exactly how Tanistrophius lived, but one thing's for sure, not like in sea monsters. Going back to the Tylosaurus, in 2008, a juvenile mosasaur fossil actually preserved the marking of a tail fluke. Before this, and in the documentary, mosasaurs were, and sadly still are, shown with an eel-like tail. The presence of a fluke makes sense, since it would have helped these predators gain higher speeds despite some of their large sizes. And lastly, as if I didn't mention it enough already, it is possible that Dunkleosteus had lips. Typically, you see them with that thick, bony beak sticking out. Yeah, it looks cool, but we also have to consider the possibility of lips. Most fish have them, even the large predatory ones with fearsome teeth. But to be fair, Dunkleosteus didn't have real teeth, so maybe it didn't need to protect their shears in the same way. Sorry to keep ruining your favorite carnivores with lips. <laughs> If you remember from my previous videos, Walking with Dinosaurs got a C+, and Chased by Dinosaurs got a C for accuracy. Although they're both good as entertainment and are still fun to watch, neither one holds up very well scientifically. This means that the worst parts of sea monsters are when we see holdovers from these older dino docs. The Leoplorodon is an obvious one, but also the Pteranodon, Tyrannosaurus, and Coelophysis are all pretty rough. That's rough, buddy. Since I just mentioned T-Rex, it's worth pointing out that sea monsters showed it living 75 million years ago, which is dead wrong. That's when Gorgosaurus and Aspletosaurus were alive. The first Vexes didn't appear until 68 million years ago in the late Maastrichtian. Pteranodon also appears in this segment despite dying out 10 million years sooner. Jeez, Chased by Dinosaurs puts them early, sea monsters puts them later, just get it right. I already discussed everything wrong with them in those previous documentaries, so I won't get too deep into it here. Apart from these guys being tonight's big loser, everyone else is pretty much in the right time, and I'm not going to be too picky about placement because a lot of creatures have the whole world to swim. During the first episode in Nigel's Ordovician segment, his main target is an animal that he only refers to as Orthocone. This is incorrect. Orthocone isn't the name of any particular genus. Instead, it's a term used to describe the straight and pointy shells of some cephalopods. This would be like referring to a turtle as a shell or a rhino as a horn. Orthocones don't even appear within a single natural grouping. They've convergently evolved within different groups. Based on the time period and anatomy of this creature, my best bet is we're looking at a Camaroceras. A what? A giant nautilid capable of growing over 30 feet long. If only Nigel could use its actual name, so I wouldn't have done 10 minutes of extra research, but as the meme goes... Oh, it is what it is! The last major problem I'll bring up is Sea Monster's portrayal of Tylosaurus social behavior. These aquatic lizards are shown traveling in pods and even caring for their young. This depiction the show gives us does not line up with our understanding of Mosasaurs. Tylosaurus fossils have been found with deep, unhealed bite marks made by another murderous Tylosaurus. This is direct fossil evidence that these guys did not get along well together. Also, we have to consider that the closest living relatives to Mosasaurs are the monitor lizards or snakes, although which group is closer has been debated for decades. Most members of both groups don't care for their young for very long, if at all, nor do they travel together in packs. There are some exceptions, but this isn't the norm for squamates. So with fossil evidence and looking at extant relatives, we can safely assume that mosasaurs did not travel or hunt in pods. Nigel Marvin's return is much more accurate than his first debut on the channel. Even though Sea Monsters isn't my favorite documentary, I still have to be fair and give credit where credit is due. You can really tell that the writers and producers stepped up their game from last time. Maybe part of it was having a focus on mostly unknown creatures, so there was no need to conform to mainstream views. I can't say for sure, but even with a few flaws, Sea Monsters holds up very well, and that is why I'm giving it a B+. 
Aquatic animals usually make an appearance in these documentaries, but don't tend to be the focus, so I'm glad they were done justice here. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.